What's up guys? This is Pete Carothers Clark. Today we're going to do something a little bit more technical. We're going to learn how to use PyoSolver to build up a library of GTO solutions. The point of today's video is to have a long-term database of spots that you can load up within a second whenever you want to check out a certain spot that you've played or want to review parts of a session or discuss hands with friends or whatever it may be. We're not recommending building this library for in-game use. Obviously that would be highly unethical and this is in no way anything to do with real-time assistance. We're just looking to build up an archive so that long-term you can really become a studying beast. So you can access a spot within seconds and load lots of spots into GTO trainers and there's all kinds of advantages that come from, from doing this. So there's going to be three main aspects to today's tutorial. First part of the the video is going to be about tree building, how to make sure you've got the right parameters within PyoSolver, the right bet sizes to give you consistency and meaningful outputs. You want to avoid at all costs the garbage in, garbage out problem. We are also going to learn how to import ranges, how to paste those in, what ranges to use, how to save parameters, how to go with the whole tree building thing. Scripting is obviously going to be not everyone's cup of tea. But if you do use Pio Pro, you're going to have the option of running multiple sims while you're asleep at night. If you just have Pio Basic and aren't interested in doing this, then this video maybe isn't for you or this part of it isn't for you. But this is going to be very useful for anyone who wants to build high volume of solved spots in the, on their computer, on their hard drive that they can load up at their convenience. We're also going to talk about archiving. Once you've built a large amount of spots, how do you organize them in a kind of librarian-esque way? How do you make sure they're in your computer in a way that you can pull out exactly the hand you want from exactly the spot you want at a moment's notice? This is all about convenience. It's all about becoming a long-term study beast, basically. Part one of the video is on tree building. Let's get into that. So here we are. So here we are in the main screen of PyoSolver. There's lots of things we need to do to set up the right inputs for our GTO library. The first thing is the ranges, and you can actually grab these on my website, carrotcorner.com. I'm actually selling GTO solved ranges for the stakes that you play. These come in both a PDF where you can scroll down and find the relevant range, and also a notepad file where you can actually copy and paste into the solver. So the range we need here for the sim we're going to set up, which is a simple button versus big blind 2-bit pot, is firstly this one, which is range number 4. We can locate this in the text file under button open, and we can actually grab this text if you own this product here, copy it, head over to Pio, and simply paste in the in position box that gives us a GTO button opening range with the rate structure of 100 NL. Zoom, which is, I think, going to be 5% rake capped at 2.5 BBs. We then need to grab the big blind defense range, which we can actually find. So we're going to scroll down and look for big blind call versus button in this product here. So here we have big blind call versus button 2.5. Note that these are equipped with the, the right frequencies as well. I'm going to grab that, copy it, and throw that into the out of position box like so. So that's how it's got our ranges. It's very important that you guys use solid game theory ranges for this. If you do it yourself, the problem is that you may not weight it correctly. You might have certain hands with kind of wacko weightings that are three betting way too often, calling way too often, that sort of thing. So it's very good to have shading like we do here. And it's caracorner.com forward slash solved ranges if you want to pick those up. You may get your ranges from somewhere else. That's also totally fine. Next, we'll put in a flop. It doesn't really matter for now what the flop is. We'll just slam in a queen, jack six, two-tone board. Starting pot, we're going to use a 510 game. Just be really careful here that you don't use decimals. They don't really agree with Pio. Starting pot's going to be 55 because we're going to open to 25 chips in a 510 game. That's two and a half big blinds. Big blind's going to call, and then there's going to be a dead five chips of small blind in the pot from the small blind folding. The effective stack will be 1,000 that we started with, minus 25 chips that we opened. This is always the effective stack for the flop, right? So just make sure that you're not using what the stack was pre-flop. 
bet sizes, this is where I'm actually quite particular, and with my stable of students, I tend to recommend 33 and 75 for the flop, 33, 75, and 150, an over bet for the turn. River is basically the same, but with a giant all-in sort of esque option there, 400. Raise sizes, you can get away with 4x to save on tree space. If you give it multiple raise sizes, you'll be looking at a big, big tree. And you'll also be looking at a situation where the solver's splitting branches a lot on any time when you're looking at a flop raise. It's going to be sometimes raising one size, sometimes raising another. I don't mind plugging in multiple raise sizes sort of experimentally at times just to see the effect, but I, I tend to use 4x across the board. You can also add all in here if you want. I don't think it's really necessary. We can copy this over. This button is your friend and leave all of this as is down the bottom. If you ever want to force, however, one player to bet all of their range, then these buttons work very well for that. In this case, we would force the out of position player to check and then position player to bet since big blind's hardly going to be donk betting range against button. I would take these bet sizes out to also make the tree smaller and more similar to what happens in pool. In most pools, even 200, 500 zoom for that matter, donk betting on the flop in this spot is a very small percentage thing and almost all regs, 98% of regs or something, guessing here will simplify to not having a donk bet strategy. So it definitely is sensible to get rid of that option. Once you've done that, your sim is good to go. So you're going to build the tree. This is the point where the solver will tell you if it doesn't have enough memory or whatever. And you're going to say go. The parameters that we're using here, this will start the sim. The parameters that we're using here are going to be very normal for a 2-bet pot. If you want to work on something like a 3-bet pot, obviously you'll have to recalibrate the bet sizes. The good thing about this range product is that it will tell you what sizing people use. And that's the same for 3-bets as well, so you'll always know how big to make the pot if you are working off of my ranges in CarrotCorner.com. Next up, we are going to look at what happens when the sim is finished and how to navigate the interpretation of that sim briefly, then we're going to move on and examine scripting. One thing we can do though while we're waiting on the sim solving is to save the parameters and I would recommend building a new folder to do this in because the folders it comes with are a bit cumbersome and very useless for most people's purposes in the modern day. So I would just name this something like my trees. What you're doing here basically is building the sort of exoskeletons of game trees um, and then within there you're going to want to save these parameters and I would be quite particular with this and call this 2BP, meaning 2-bet pot. A 2-bet pot is basically a single raise pot, right? It's the one size smaller than a 3-bet pot and you want to just name the positions here to keep this nice and clear so that you can always find the right parameter you want to build. You can save these parameters as button versus big blind. That makes things very, very easy. You can just load up the MyTrees folder, find the parameters that you want. Ideally, you'll build up lots and lots of parameters and be able to run a sim whenever you need to. But another way of being able to load parameters into Pio is simply loading up a tree you've already solved. I'm going to show you guys how to do that in the third part of this video. People wonder about accuracy. The right accuracy for interpreting a Pio sim is generally somewhere between 0.5 and 1. Of course, if you go below 0.5, it's going to be even more accurate. There'll be less sort of frequency errors in there and stuff. However, generally 0.5 is what I look for for the sim to be very usable. I wouldn't stop this at 4%. If you do that, you'll see some weird stuff going on, like the solver thinking one line is clearly higher EV than another, but sometimes taking the really bad line. Whenever you see that, you know there's some kind of GTO, um, it's not a GTO error, like it's not the solver misunderstanding, it's simply it's not solved the right frequency yet. The right exploitativity, sorry, exploitab exploitability. So when we stop the sim, the results become available. We need to wait for it to say solver stopped. As you can hear, my PC maybe there has stopped working its ass off. You can flip over to the browser here and start to navigate through the game tree like so. It'll be another video where I talk about how to really understand solver output. Today is about building up the the library, so let's look at how to solve this tree. So in order to, to sorry, save this tree. So in order to do that, we're going to go file, save, small tree. We don't want to save trees in a way where we're actually saving the full thing. 
it does say without rivers, which can be a bit confusing. That doesn't mean that you can't view every river in the deck in the solved tree. You can. It's just that if you wanted to node lock from the river and create a new subtree within that, you would not be able to unless you saved as a full tree. You can see here that when I'm saving this on my computer, I have a lot of different folders in this post flop solves directory. I have two bit pots, three bit pots, four bit pots, cold calls, all kinds of stuff. As this one is a two bit pot, I'm gonna go in here. As it's button versus big blind, I'm gonna go in here and I'm simply gonna name it whatever the flop was. So in this case, queen of hearts, jack of hearts, six of spades. I'll save it in there and I can load it up whenever I want to, just like that. I can also load up lots of my other sims whenever I want and you can even have multiple instances of Pyo running with multiple sims open at the same time. Now onto scripting. How did I actually build such a vast library of spots? The way I built this up was by running scripts on a relatively powerful computer while I was asleep. This computer spec is, it has like an i9 processor, I'm not really a computer guy, um, but I'll tell you what I know, it has 64 megabits, megabits of RAM which is more than enough and it's generally just new and fast and good and I like it and it probably has more technical gizmo stats too. If you're interested I can look them up, but you're generally looking for about, I would say, 32 um, gig of RAM is very comfortable for building all trees that you need to build post flop. Moving on to scripting, if I want to run multiple flops in this same spot, in a button versus big blind single race pot, all I have to do is click generate script. This will bring up the scripting window and there's a few things we need to do here. The first thing we need to do when we're running a script is we have to make sure that the directory that we're saving the solutions into when they complete is the right directory. So here we have the whole archiving thing going on and I've just taken the local URL from my directory here. So if I go into this big blind versus button folder here, you can see it has its own local sort of URL ID, whatever you call that. I just say control C, just copy that and I can paste it in here like so. So it's worth, it's always worth doing that first, just to make sure your sims don't end up in some silly place that you can never find them. Click small saves, you don't want any of these trees being saved in full, they're massive and they're very slow to work with in that format and it's unnecessary. I set it to 0.75%, that's for speed, if you want to forego a little bit of accuracy for more speed, you could try 1%, I wouldn't go much higher than that. If you want to forego speed for accuracy, you could always solve this down to 0.25 for like a super accurate sim, but it will, it will take exponentially longer. The next thing we need to do is generate some flops. Now some people work on subsets of flops. You can do that if you just want to compare maybe 50 flops that represent the game tree. If however, you want to build a vast collection, a library of, of solves that you can load up and find almost any flop, then you're just going to want a ton of flops. I know my computer could do about 400 flops in a day, therefore if I want to set this to run for 24 hours, I'd generate about 400, and as you can see, they're all different, they have some weightings here, don't worry too much about that. Um, that's mainly for when you're using aggregation reports to look at the, you know, how often a certain range bets across different textures and averages and things like that. If you're just loading up sims singularly for your studies, then you can kind of ignore this, but don't tamper with this. If you remove a weighting, it might mess the whole thing up. The next thing we do when running the script is we want to say generate script. This is important. If there's nothing in this box, it has nothing to run. So just to recap, we've got the, the right target folder directory. We've got it set to small saves, very important. We've got it set to not go forever. It's just going to solve until 0.75% pot accuracy. And we've generated a, a bunch of flops for it to do while we sleep or while we leave the house or whatever. We then say script, run the script, and this console window will appear. It should say add line OK all the way down and then go OK solver started. Look out for error messages there. If you do get something like insufficient memory, blah, 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 you're going to have to go back and make sure that you clear some RAM on your computer or make the tree a bit smaller. But if this, if it builds the first flop, it should be able to build all of them. Sometimes you want to make sure that you're not cutting that close because certain flops take up a lot more RAM um, than others. A flop like 
something low where lots of cards are betting and calling and continuing of lots of different varieties tends to take up more RAM than, than a high flop in general, but it's not always the case. Basically any flop where the players reach the turn with a wider range after C betting call tends to take up more space, in my experience. So anyway, that's kind of how it works, and remember when the script is completed, we can access the results by going to the right folder. Don't close this window while the script is active. You can close all the other PIO windows. If you close this window, you can find the same script again in the folder, in the destination folder, and in the event that you need to like abandon the script to sort of shut down your computer or something, you can load it up and run the script again. It should resume from where it left off. The end result that we're looking for here, guys, is basically a nice, logical, construction of game theory solutions in my post flop solves here you can see i have two bit pots three bit pots four bit pots within these i have lots of different situations with lots of different boards it's an incredibly powerful thing to have and it means that when i play a session and i'm confused about a spot i can just set out the tables very important not to cheat in real time load up the spot and see how i played the hand and the more you do that the better you get at poker so I'll just finish this video by saying that technically the biggest boost in my game I've ever experienced is when I built this library of sims, started looking at it as I sat out of the tables, as I sort of took breaks in my session and as I worked in a trainer. We'll do a future video on this channel where we look at how to set up Lucid the GTO trainer or similar to make use of this sim library. For more from me guys, check out CarrotCorner.com, check out my Twitch channel Carrot underscore Corner and be very happy if you would like and subscribe. Help me grow this YouTube channel as well. See you guys on another video very soon, and I hope this has been useful. Bye for now.